Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study. And uh, hopefully more people join us as we go along here. But in this study today, we're going to basically do a review by reading Bob Pickle's article on uh, who are these seven kings. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have here this morning to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence as we do a review of what we understand so far about Revelation 17. And um, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can guide us, correct any errors we may have in our understanding, but help us to understand clearly uh, the issues involved and why this chapter is important. Uh, we pray for this movement. We pray for Elder Jeff and others um, in Arkansas. We pray for the movement throughout the world. And um, we pray, Lord, that you can help us uh, to reflect your character to each other and to those around us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good, good good morning again, everyone. So, um, Bob Pickle, you know his weird name. He's a Seventh Day Adventist who uh, uh, basically is uh, an amateur and apologist for Adventism. He writes all kinds of articles supporting uh, Adventism, uh, some very detailed information. He's not always correct, um, uh, you know, but but. He's he's conservative. Um, I know that when I read, you know, when I first ran into him, it was researching uh, issues dealing with um, 1844 and the dates there. Um, how do we prove, you know, October 22nd, 1844? And, and he would be answering uh, anti-Adventist websites. Sometimes I think I actually first found him because it's an anti-Adventist website uh, was uh, examining what he said about October 22nd, 1844. So then I finally went to his website and read what he had to say. Um, but what he does here in this article is a good overview for us to, to examine what we've studied so far about Revelation 17. And, and, and he's going to be presenting lots of different views and options some that we've considered. He obviously has not considered uh, everything that we've considered, but it's a good way of reviewing and then trying to pull this all together. So I'm not sure how much God is going to reveal to us about Revelation 17, whether we're going to understand it completely or not. Um, but that's what we're attempting to do, to understand God's word. And that's why we invited the Holy Spirit uh, to help us in this regard. So he's going to go through... This basic idea in Revelation 17, John sees a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. The beast has seven heads and ten horns. Who is the woman? What are the heads? Right. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And here's a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The city that reigned over the kings of the earth for so long and which sits on seven hills is unquestionably Rome, somehow connected with this scene, are seven kings. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So you can even see here, he's saying that we have this scene, Rome sitting upon seven hills. They're represented, they're symbolized as heads, but they're explained as being seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. And, and so it seems to me that this is really a vision where we have a direct interpretation of who this woman is. Now, as he talks about these seven kings, he just says, somehow kings, somehow connected with the scene are seven kings. So we know that these seven kings then don't aren't necessarily the seven heads, which is what has been assumed by many people, is we talk about the seven heads, 
And then we talk about the seven kings and we say, well, the seven kings are the seven heads. But it doesn't say that, right? So, so the fact that it doesn't say that the heads are mountains and thus are kings, it just says there are seven kings. So these are two different groups of seven. The seven heads representing the hills of Rome, uh, the seven kings representing something else. And so then he's going to look at this. He says there's three basic views that, that either the seven kings are individual kings. And, and so you can see these can be applied to emperors. And, and actually, that's sort of what Odilio was doing. Now, this is usually considered the preterist view. And um, that is, they want to see revelation fulfilled in the first century. Um, and so they don't have any application to end time events with the preterist view. Now, the ones that we are often familiar with when it comes to individuals are the seven individual popes. This, I had a pastor who was teaching this. Um, now his predictions didn't span out or pan out because at the time he, you know, Pope John Paul II was Pope, and then we're going to have um, whatever the guy's name was. Uh, what was the Pope after Pope John Paul II? Can't think of his name. Now we have Francis. So they weren't predicting anyway that we were going to have this many popes. Was it Ignatius or something? What's his name? What's the, what's the other pope? I can't even remember the pope's name. Benedict, that's it. Yeah, Pope Benedict. Thank you, dear. Yeah, I knew it was one of those those names. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, seven kingdoms. So this is the view that that this movement has had is that we're going to take the heads as being Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal. Now, different people have the, the um, uh, different starting points. There are people who would take the kingdoms as Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. Um, and that's because uh, they want Rome to be the one that is, right? So there's different views regarding that. Um, and obviously, we got Rome pagan and Rome papal. Those are the first five kings. Then, of course, you're going to have to, the United States is the sixth and the UN is the seventh. That's uh, definitely how we would apply it to Revelation 13. And then, of course, the pioneer view, the seven forms of Roman government. But you can see here that, that in these views of the kingdoms and the government, that they're definitely interpreting the heads as the kings, right? Not seeing them as something different. And, and we still haven't decided if this is the correct interpretation to see them as something different, but it definitely is something that I had never considered before. Okay. <clears throat> so the question then about time. So we look at this whole issue of time. Five are fallen. One is, well, when is, is. Um, and he says one of the most important questions that needs to be answered is when is it true that five kings have fallen? Now, this is um, now we looked at some of this thing about the time element. So remember in Daniel chapter eight. So there was this argument. The argument was that um, when the when the angel explains a vision, the angel is going to explain the vision from the perspective of the time that the prophet is living not from the time that the vision is showing. But we know when we looked at Daniel chapter 8, Daniel is brought, he's in the time of Babylon, and he's brought into the time of Persia. And if we look at the explanation unto 2,300 days, Daniel must be at the beginning of the 2,300 days in vision, and the angel is going to explain the start of it from that time of Persia, not from the time of Babylon. And so this means that you can't use that argument that the angel is, is only going to explain the is from when the person is in his own time, not from where the person is in vision. 
so I, I think that that's uh, one of the things about it. Now he shows here um, in Daniel chapter 11. So he's going to use this argument. I will give power unto my witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three school days closed in clothed in sackcloth, sackcloth, sackcloth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. So these are things we would call the incomplete tense, what we, we call future tenses. But in, in Hebrew, it's an incomplete tense. But then the one speaking to John places both the preaching and the slaying of the two witnesses into the future. Thus, the time context of the conversation with John is prior to those events. And yet, after three days and a half, the spirit of God, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. So you're going to have this more either uh, ascended. That's a past tense. Right. So you have these past tenses. Now, John is describing what he actually saw in vision, not a conversation with some heavenly being. He describes scenes he saw of the future as if they were already past. So that's a really common way in which prophets see things. They're either talking in the present tense or something that has happened. When John describes scenes of the future that he saw, he describes them as past. When John records a conversation explaining future events, he describes those events as if they are yet future. And he says, we may safely conclude that the time context of such a conversation is John's day. So he's taking that position that when they're having this conversation, it must be from the time in which John lives. But we can see that that's not really necessarily the case. Just because it's in the future tense doesn't mean that it has to be from John's point of view, if, if that makes sense. Um So, so this is, so this is, is, you know, it's basically the crux of the whole problem that people have with this. Now, then we've asked this question, how can we tell when the is is? That, that is still, you know, one of the things we have to decide and we have to figure it out uh, so that we, we can determine that because definitely it can't be from the time of John. And, and we've looked at that because of the explanation that's given. Um, it says that, that the woman was, right? And, or the beast was, and the beast couldn't have been, was, and is in the time of John. If that beast represents the Catholic church, right? So, so we'll look at that again, but, you can see that it's not as simple as he makes it and, and that there's something more to it that we still have to discern. Um, so the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, you know, part of the problem is deciding who this beast is. Well, we know that this beast is of the seven and it's the eighth. And so we have to figure out what that means. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Right? So we know that they will receive power. Now it says here, it doesn't say they will receive power. It says, but receive power. That's that's actually in, uh, what do they call that? Uh, active participle? No, I can't remember what they call that. But the thing is, it's just receive. It's not past, it's not future, sort of like a present tense. <clears throat> yeah, so active, I think it's, I can't remember. I always forget some of these grammatical terms, but I understand what it means. It's it's more like a present tense, even though it's talking in a sense in the future. It's just, I uh, can't think of the word. Anyway, John saw scenes of a beast and horns as if they already existed. After this, he is told that the beast doesn't yet exist again and that the horns have no kingdom yet. So he saw them as if they already existed. He is told they don't exist yet. And this would be true if the time context of the angels conversation was in John's day. So let's just look at that again. So we looked at this yesterday 
And we can see that there's problems with this interpretation. So when we look at Revelation 17, if we're going to take, we're taking the view, let's take this view that he has, that we're brought in vision to the future. And um, because this is a, a woman from John's day that's in the future. So he's going to be brought into the future. And, and we say that this is going to have to be, um, and he agrees it's in the future. He doesn't think it's, it's in John's day, that this is the beast. This woman riding this beast is in the future. It's, it's the 1260 years. It's in the time of the wilderness. And it's near, it, it's after that period of time, right? Because, because it's describing her, what she was doing during that time. Um, cause the, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the, and that's, uh, verse six and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So this is the woman that's being described. And then he wondered with great admiration. And in verse seven, and the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So there's two things that he's going to tell the mystery of to John, and that's the woman and the beast that carrieth her. And then he says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. The problem that we have here is to say, is not, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, when is the beast is not, right? Can you say that the beast is not and it was? So you first you have to say the beast was and it's no longer and it's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, if this beast is the papacy, you couldn't say from John day, John's day that the beast was and is not. Now, you could say, well, I'm going to tell you that when you saw this vision, the, at that time, the beast was and is not. That makes more sense if it's applying to the Catholic Church, because we know the Catholic Church was and is not, and it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So I don't see how his argument, because this is the angel explaining it, and and so it doesn't really make any sense unless you're going to say that this beast is something that's not the Catholic Church. Now, we could say the beast is the kingdoms of this world. Uh, the way that it's understood by Uriah Smith is um, you know, that this beast is, is Rome. Um, but he doesn't, you know, it doesn't really make any sense. This, that's where I have the problem. I understand the reasoning, but I don't see how it applies here. Any, any thoughts on that? How could you say, if you're saying that it's from John's day, that this beast, if you believe it to be the papacy, because you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, how could you say that it was and is not? Because this is the explanation, right? This isn't his vision. So from what he's written, it doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't follow. So I don't know if people can help me. Is there something I'm not understanding about his argument? He's going to move here to about the beast rising out of the bottomless pit, right? Ascending out of the bottomless pit. Does anybody understand his argument? Because it doesn't follow when I read this. It doesn't make sense. He says, when John describes the scenes of the future that he saw, he describes them as being past. When John records a conversation, Explaining future events, he describes those events 
events as if they are yet future. We may safely conclude that the time context of such a conversation is John's day. But when we say that the that it was, the beast was, can that be true in John's day? Right? It doesn't make any sense to me. What because he seems to be contradicting himself. No, he mustn't be. I mean, he must be logical. Right? People are always logical. Are they? <laughs> well, maybe that was a rhetorical sort of statement. Right. But I assume that people should be logical. But we can quite clearly see that if this beast was, and that was from John's day, it it couldn't possibly be the papacy. Right? That when we say the beast was, it must be from the future that this perspective is being spoken of. Right. Okay. Unless you were arguing the beast was something else other than the papacy. But I don't see how we could argue that as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so it seems to me that he's sort of uh, compartmentalizing his argument. He looks at it in one way because he's focused more upon this, the seven heads. Because he's going to say, well, the seven heads... Five are fallen. So when he's going to say five are fallen, that must be from John's day. Yet, if you're taking that view, it's from John's day, then the beast that thou sawest was must also be from John's day. And that can't be that it was and is not in John's day. Right? Because the beast is not the seven heads or the five heads that are fallen or, you know, the one that is can't be one of the heads and also the beast. You understand what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't make sense. To it doesn't track. I can't understand his argument. In a superficial reading, I see how people can do that. But once you really pay attention to the details, you can't possibly put the explanation in John's day. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so now he's going to talk about these five kings. So you're just going to move. Um, uh, so, and he says, okay, one last thought on the matter. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. John saw scenes of a beast and horns as if they already existed. Right After this, he is told that the beast doesn't yet exist again. And that the horns have no kingdom yet. So he saw them as if they already existed, but he is told that they don't exist yet. This would be true of the, uh, if the time context of the angel's conversation was in John's day. So he's saying the horns are these ten kingdoms, right? So he's taking the, the ten horns that have no received no kingdom as, as yet. So he's interpreting these ten horns then as the ten uh, divisions of the Western Roman Empire. Right. All right. Well, that's what he. But but because he's interpreting it that way, he has to see that well. The explanation must be from John's day because these kings didn't exist yet in John's day. But if these ten kings are the United Nations and they have received no kingdom, because that kingdom they receive. And, and even if they were the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, the question is, what kind of kingdom is this talking about? Because it says they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Is this talking about something in the past from our perspective or something in the future? And, and if John is, is still in the future and the explanation is from the future, this would still have to be future. But you kind of can't have it both ways. You can't have the, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit as being from John's day and the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings being from John's day if you know that the beast is the Catholic Church it's the papacy right so 
Because it says the beast was. It's past tense. So it has to be from the future that the explanation is being given, if the beast is the papacy. Okay, so now he's going to just move to the five kings um, and, and the seven heads as being kings, right? So again, he's just putting them all together. The heads must be the kings or whatever. So let's look at this. If five kings were already fallen in John's day, we can narrow down the possibilities for the identification of the seven kings. The idea that they are seven popes is out, as well as the idea that they are seven kingdoms beginning with Babylon. If they are indeed seven kingdoms, the sequence would have to start with Egypt. For if we start the sequence with Babylon, only three kingdoms, Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece, would be fallen in John's day. So you can see it's not possible that the explanation is John's day. You can't say five of fallen one is, is from John's day. You just can't do it. Now, they try to do it, and and because they're looking at each of the, they're looking at the kings, this riddle, they're applying it to the heads. And we're saying there's no reason to apply it to the heads. Right? That's what we're saying. That it, it doesn't mean this riddle is not applied to the heads. It's applied to the kings. But they're applying it to the heads. So they're getting confused between these things. But now they're going to just say, well, the kings are the heads. And so what are the heads of the beast? And that they always have to be the same. They have to be the same in chapter 12, 13, and 17. And we say they don't. Now, this is, um, uh, so let's hear. So he's going to go through the idea that these are uh, different emperors. You got Caesar, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius Caesar, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba. Um, now, this is actually the list that's given by uh, Odilio, right? Anybody remember Odilio's study? Correct. So he's going to to focus on Nero. He's going to compare Nero with Trump. And Nero is the one who, you know, fiddles while Rome burns, right? Which is going to be July 18th. His, his reign is going to begin, I can't remember the years, but the dates of his reign are going to start on um, October 13th and end on June 9th, I believe. And those two dates in our history in 2018, are that period of 126 days from June 9th to October 13th. So it's going to be a reverse of that. So so it's it's really interesting what Nero represents. And I'm saying that Odilio, what he sees there about Nero is actually correct. That is, there is that connection between Nero and Trump. But then he's going to uh, count the five are fallen, the one is, and the one is yet to come, just like this first list. Caesar, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero being the sixth, and Galba being the seventh. Now, different people give different lists. None of these other lists make sense. Um, but I don't think if you're going to apply these seven um that you're going to say that there are seven, uh, you know, first seven emperors, and you're going to try to uh, label them. If you're going to label this as the time of the end, we know we don't have Julius Caesar at the time of the end. We have Caesar Augustus, right? And so Augustus would be the first one, and so the fifth one would be Nero. Right. And then you have those three that all happened in the same year, Galba and the other two. And then, and then you finally have uh, Titus, right? So, so we're going to look at that at some point again in more detail. But just for now, we can see that, that this is usually an interpretation done by preterists. But then the problem here is you have to put John in the time of Nero. John isn't in the time of Nero. Right. When he's writing. 
he he's going to be in. Uh, he's going to be way past Nero. Yeah, and, and, and I'm trying to remember because he's writing in '96, and I can't remember. It's either Domitian. Um, can't remember who's the emperor in or '97. Yes, you're right. According to what I've read, same year, same same emperor. Domitian. Yes. Okay. Right. So, okay. <clears throat> and uh, because he's going to be exiled to the Isle of Patmos by Domitian, I think, is, is the idea. So Nero's, Nero's not going to be the one who, who exiles John. Okay. Um, right. The first list necessitates, nece- necessitates that John be exiled to Patmos. During the reign of Nero, which seems unlikely, Julius Caesar was never really an emperor. And what would be the point of ending with Galba? What would be the point of the prophecy? Right Now, of course, there may be a point, even if that was correct, that he doesn't see. That's never a good argument. Um, uh, now we have the ten kings. So Daniel 7.24 also speaks of the ten horns representing ten kings, which parallel Daniel's two's ten toes. Of those toes, we are told, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we've talked about the ten toes and the ten horns. We haven't really um, dealt with them in detail. We know in 1888 at the General Conference that there was a debate regarding the numbering of these 10 tribes uh, or the 10 horns or the 10 toes. But I take the position that that just the 10 is a symbol in Daniel chapter two of the kingdoms of the world. It's not to be taken literally. It's a symbol. Though we know that we are going to apply it to it with the fall of the Roman empire to the Germanic tribes that come in and conquer Rome, so that the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7 are going to be those ten nations of Europe. But to argue that it always has to be, the ten always has to be those things, uh, doesn't make sense. We can see that the heads are not always the same thing in Revelation 12 and 13. They're not the same thing. And there's no reason why the horns always have to be the same thing. It is is a symbol in Daniel 2 that is not differentiated. That is, it's just a characteristic of the end that you have the world, the 10. And for Rome, for pagan Rome, when it falls, it's divided into 10. And papal Rome is going to, uh, you know, conquer three of those horns, um, you know, pull them up by the roots, right, in order to establish its kingdom. Those are the three geographical locations just like pagan Rome had in establishing um, uh, its its empire, right? So um, so the idea that these ten toes are these ten kings, the ten divisions of Rome, that these are then always the same thing, I think is something that can't be supported. And we definitely can say that these ten kings – that have no received no kingdom as of yet would still be true today. That this is something future because they're going to reign one hour with the beast, and that is the Sunday law. That's how we would understand that. So he says, if the ten horns of Revelation 17 are also ten kings at the time of the end, they must be the same ten kings as those of Daniel 2 and 7. And we wouldn't agree with that. That's actually not even logical. He says, otherwise, we would have 20 kings, two sets of 10 at the end of time. And that, again, this is this is the type of argument that Uriah Smith made. Same type of argument. And it's not a valid argument. Can we agree that it's not a good argument? That it doesn't follow logically. Ten is a symbol of the world. They don't have to be the same ten kings. 
And here, you know, we're, we're talking about 10 kings. Well, obviously, you know, we, we take them not necessarily as kings, but as kingdoms when it comes to the 10 tribes. But do those 10 t- tribes exist in the present day? Weren't three uprooted? So it would be a problem. Okay. There, where should we look to find the seven kings? So he says, we'll glean some possible answers. Um, so I got to go back to here. You're not even looking at what I'm looking at. Okay. <clears throat> so again, he's going to conflate the kings with the mountains. Now, looking at these mountains, we can say the names of these seven mountains or hills are the Aventine, the Palatine, the Capitoline, Capitoline the Kaline, the Quirinal, 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Viminal, and Escaline. To this list, we can add an eighth, more on that later. There are supposed to have been seven kings reigning in Rome before the Roman Republic. We looked at that yesterday. So we could say, well, maybe these first seven uh, kings are symbols. Um, But we're not going to count count those at the end of the world, these seven kings. Definitely it it wouldn't fit for five or fallen one is. Um, he says to list we can add an eighth. Titus Tatius ruled jointly with Romulus after the Sabines, uh, Sabines, who of whom he was king, united with the Romans. Um, and then um, we have the legend of the founding of Rome tells us about the kings and the hills. So the different kings are going to. Um, add these hills to the city of Rome. And while Emperor Aurelian during his reign from 270 to 275 extended Rome's walls further than these hills, the old wall of Servius included just these seven, most of the Caelian and Esculi, and all the other five within Rome's limits. This wall of Servius was named after the sixth king who had supposedly extended the walls that far, but modern authorities feel it was built after the Gauls destroyed Rome in 390 BC, regardless of which is true in John's day, There were just seven hills enclosed by the walls of Rome. Since all these seven original kings of Rome were kings of Rome, and since all the seven hills of Rome were within the walls of Rome, it would make sense for the seven kings of Revelation 17 to also be in some way a part of Rome. This suggests that we should consider the idea that the seven kings of Revelation 17 are seven forms of Roman of the government of Rome. Now, see, we could apply this to Revelation 12, and to me, it would make sense for Revelation 12 for um, if you're going to talk about uh, the seven heads to be seven forms of Roman government. But it doesn't make sense to apply that at the end of the world. But again, he's going to always think it's the same. The heads are the same. The kings are the same. Now, of course, it doesn't talk about seven kings in connection with uh, Revelation 12 or Revelation 13, right? Just talks about the heads. So we would say here that these seven kings in Revelation 17 are not the heads. but We still haven't determined what they are. I don't know if people have thoughts on this. I'm doing a lot of talking asking questions and answering them myself. Okay, so we dealt with the crowns. We know that they're um, going to be upon the head of of the seven heads in Revelation 12, but they're going to be upon the ten horns, and there's going to be ten crowns in Revelation 13. And that the heads are going to have names of blasphemy instead of the crowns. So he says here, Papal Rome was not the strong central government that pagan Rome had been. Papal Rome consisted of independent, sovereign nations held together by a common religious 
religion headed by the Pope. So we can agree with this idea that when we look at uh, the crowns being upon the horns in the papal beast, the leopard-like beast, that, that this is consistent with what we, we, what we understand. Um, um, a similar picture is found in Daniel 2. Clay holds together iron fragments somewhat in the feet and toes. Likewise, the beast holds together somewhat the ten horns with their crowns. Now, Ellen White talks about uh, the iron and the clay of uh, being churchcraft and statecraft, right? So we can see that that the church and state are are holding together the kingdoms of the world in a way that's um, not stable. Okay, so. Um, and he says here in the beast of Revelation 17 has no crowns at all, suggesting that the form of government being represented by this beast is one that has no king. Indeed, this thought is not new. So he's going to say that um, this is Joseph Bates saying this. The beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago and is not. That is, it was not when John was having his vision in AD 96. Because Imperial Rome was then the form of government and continued to be until A.D. 538, when the seventh form of government came, that is, Papal Rome. Even he is the eighth. The eighth undoubtedly is, as we have shown, the two-horned beast with its image, a symbol of the people of the Republic in America, as they are and will be, and is of the seven. The eighth will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh <clears throat> okay, so Joseph Bates' view, you, you can see why he holds this view if he has that the, these are seven forms of Roman government. But the problem that we would have here, just from the time point, um, if we're saying the beast was, but it is not. Now, how is it that the beast is not just because it's imperial Rome? Does that make sense? that the beast is not in imperial Rome and that, and it's going to be ascending out of the bottomless pit resurrected with, um, with um, uh, papal Rome, right? Does it make sense? Can anybody think how it's possible that you could say that the beast is not during Imperial Rome? I had just accepted it. What's that? I had just accepted that from prior studies. Okay. Okay. Explain what you mean. How is the Roman Republic is not and that it's going to be resurrected under papal Rome? Because that's not a republic. No, I realize that it's not going to be a republic. Yeah. Because in the republic, there was not truly one central power as there has been within the papacy. And also during the time of imperial. Right. So, <clears throat> the Roman Republic is not going to be something that's going to be resurrected. The imperial Rome, with its dictators, there may be a form of it, but the the greater form would be this of the papal power. Okay. So, so if we took this view that Joseph Bates is talking about, so he's saying the beast here in, in Revelation 17 is, is not papal Rome. It's, it's just what? What would it be? Because the beast that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. If we're looking at that from John's perspective, this is a part of what we've 
we've tried to figure this out. If we're going to take Revelation 17, is the explanation is in John's day. How would we understand that? Just from my own perspective, I cannot see that this had been within John's day. Okay. But this, so this is Joseph's, but just try to put this in Joseph Bates' perspective. So he's going to say, the beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago and is not. That is, it was not when John was having his vision in AD 96. But if we're going to argue that the beast that was and is not, it would have to be not papal Rome. It would have to be pagan Rome, right? Correct. So the beast would have to represent pagan Rome. Or the beast could represent both pagan and papal Rome. Or could just represent Rome in the broadest sense. And then you would just say, well, from the republic form, it is not. In John's day. But this still creates problems. It doesn't really solve the riddle. So he's going to say uh, Imperial Rome was uh, the one that is. That's the sixth form of Roman government. It continues until AD 538 when the seventh form of government came. That is Papal Rome. Then it says, he even, even he is the eighth. So here, um, now we know that the beast is the eighth, right? At least that's the way that we understand it. The beast that was, is not, and yet is, even he is the eighth. Right? Now he's going to say the eighth undoubtedly is, as we have shown, the two-horned beast with its image, a symbol of the people of Republican America as they are and will be, and is of the seven. The eighth will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh. So he interprets this a little bit differently. um, Because when you know that the Greek says, and comes from the seven, its origin is of the seven. It doesn't say it is one of the seven. Its origin is of the seven. So, so again, we can see that these interpretations have problems with them. Okay, so he says here, the present author would differ a little with the above, but the point is that Bates identifies the beast of Revelation 17, the one without crowns, as being a republic, a revival of the republicanism of old Rome, a republicanism that republicanism that was dead at the time John wrote the book of Revelation. This coincides with the idea that the absence of crowns indicates a government that has no king. So what do we think of that thought? Because we know there's crowns on the heads of the beast of Revelation 12. There's crowns on the horns of the beast of Revelation 13. There is no crowns upon uh, the horns or the heads in the beast of Revelation 17. So these are the kingdoms of this world, but uh, do they necessarily need to be republics? I mean, a democracy also has no kings, right? Correct. So, I mean, this could be describing the democracies at the end of the world in our day, because we see the monarchies in this period of time since 1798 slowly disappear to the point there's very few monarchies left. Uh, We end up with various forms of democracies. But that these, that the world is going to receive crowns or receive kingdoms one hour with the beast. 
Now, now we understand that to be the Sunday law. I mean, that's how I've understood it. This is the United Nations uniting with the papacy. And, um, of course, with the beast of Revelation 13, the United States at the end of the world. But um, that's how we've understood it. And, and I, I believe that that's correct. <clears throat> but this idea that the republic, that this refers to the republicism. So, so the idea that you would have with Joseph Bates is you have republicanism ends. Uh, so if the sixth is, um, uh, so if the five are fallen are uh, these different forms of Roman government, the sixth is imperialism, imperial Rome, and then the seventh is papal Rome, and the eighth is just the United States arising at the end of the world in this republican form of government. That, that's the idea I get from what Bates is saying. So when he talks about the eighth, this, he's talking about the beast of Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, the two-horned beast. The two-horned beast will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh, the papacy. So there, there is some virtue in this idea. I mean, I like the idea. It, it fits with what we understand. But then we have to interpret the beast as just Rome. Now, the woman, of course, we still have this problem that the woman is the papacy. Now, if you're saying that one of the heads is the papacy itself, that would, that is possible. I'm not saying it's not possible. Um, So we still haven't really determined what the seven heads are in the beast of Revelation 17. We know in chapter 12, it's consistent with them being the seven forms of Roman government. We know in chapter 13, it's consistent with them being Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan and papal, the United States and the UN. So then we have problems understanding this eighth. But remember, we we say that the kings are not necessarily the same as the heads, that there seems to be a distinction between them. And that the riddle then would not apply to the heads, but to the kings. So it still becomes something that we have to uh put our mind around, you know, so that we can understand it fully. <clears throat> I just think that if you start to make the heads a part of the riddle, it still seems to break down. That these seven kings, five are fallen, one is, must be something else other than the heads. Now, the question is, why do we have the heads in Revelation 17, well, it tells us the heads are seven mountains. So is this consistent? So if we have the seven heads in Revelation 12 being seven forms of Roman government, that makes sense because we're dealing with Rome, pagan Rome, and it's seven forms of Roman government. Then if we go to Revelation 13, and we look at the heads, it's consistent with those heads representing the kingdoms of this world, which the papacy um, is is controlling, but it's controlling it's that beast, the beast of Revelation 13, is the papal beast. It's showing that that period of 1260 years that we have this um, synchronistic power that is has all the characteristics of the kingdoms of this world and it has seven heads and those seven heads 
we're not going to have as the seven mountains. We're not going to have as the seven hills, right? We're going to have those seven hills to be kingdoms. Now, kingdoms can be represented by mountains. And maybe that's where the idea of the seven comes from altogether, whether you're applying the seven seven forms of Roman government or you're surprised, you're taking them from the seven uh, different um, kingdoms of this world that that basically this comes from the imagery of the seven seven hills maybe okay so hopefully this is helping as we we uh, tear through this Okay, so he says four passages are linguistically tied together in Revelation with their typical interpretations, while their typical interpretations have been totally unrelated. So we have um, the bottomless pit in Revelation 9-11. We have the, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11-7. Uh, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, which shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, that's Revelation 17 verse 8. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth in a two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Revelation 13 verse 11. So typically historicists have identified the beast from the bottomless pit in chapter 11 as being France during its revolution, while the beast from the bottomless pit of chapter 17 has been identified as a revived papacy. The king, the angel of the bottomless pit of chapter 9, has been identified in some way with Islam. The beast of Revelation 13 has no crowns on either its head or its horns, just like the beast of Revelation 17. Now, um, so he's talking about the second beast of Revelation 13, right? Um, because obviously the beast of Revelation 13 has crowns on, on its horns. Uh, has been identified with the United States for very different interpretations. Is there nothing that ties these symbols together? There is indeed something, and that something is republicanism. An atheistic brand of republicanism or democracy wreaked havoc, wrecked havoc? I said wreaked havoc. Uh, during the French Revolution, a Protestant band of republicanism, republicanism gave birth to the freedoms found in the United States. And the Muslims? In Mecca, despotism was impossible. The fierce, freeborn Arabs of the desert would tolerate no master, and their innate democracy had been sanctioned by the prophet who had explicitly declared that all believers were brothers. The Meccan caliphate was a theocratic democracy. Abu Bakr and Omar were elected by the people and held themselves responsible to public opinion. So he says, so when we read uh, the beast that was and is not even, he is the eighth and is of the seven and, and goeth into perdition, we are reading about a confederacy of republics, a revival of the republican form of government of old. Republicanism and democracy is the only conceivable tie between the four passages. Now, <clears throat> is that the only conceivable tie between the four passages? Does that even make sense? What he just, what we just read? No, he doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because the beast that ascends the bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit? Is that not Abaddon? Um. um well, that's the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon. Uh, pit is the earth. Okay, you're saying the bottomless pit is the earth. So you're well, saying Satan is confined to it, like a busos. Yeah, I, I think it's some, something more than just the earth. I mean, it, it's a symbol of of absolute chaos, and and it's satanic, right? Uh, to me, this just speaks of their satanic origins. Uh, to say that that's republicanism uh, doesn't really track well with me. Yeah, 
because this word here, um, okay, well, let's let's take a look at this a bit more detail. <clears throat> Okay. So this word, you know, um, abyssos, the bottomless pit. Okay, it occurs in the King James uh, nine times. It's in Revelation 9, verse 1 and 2. Revelation 9, 11, Revelation 17, verse 7 to 8, Revelation 20, right? So we're going to have the angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And um, he's going to cast Satan into this pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, right? Now, we do have it also mentioned in Luke 8, 31. Um, They besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. That's the abyss. And then Rome, that's the uh, the demons cast into the peak. And then Romans 10, 7, or who shall ascend into the deep? It's just the word deep, which is the bottomless pit. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. So what we would say is that the bottomless pit symbols, symbolizes Satan's place where he's ultimately going to be destroyed, which is is this place of chaos and destruction, right? You know, we would say it's like hell or whatever, that, that idea, the bottomless pit. It's a symbol. It's not a literal place. But we can't say it's just the earth. We definitely can't say it's republicanism. It just refers to a, a satanic origin. Would people agree with me on that? Or is there some other thing I'm missing? Now, we've just looked, of course, at the Hebrew word. Or the Greek word, pardon me. We haven't looked at the Hebrew word. So if we were to look at uh, the word void, bohu, right? Emptiness, void. Um, so that word is going to have Genesis 1, 2, Jeremiah 4, 23. It beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. Of course, that's really using that imagery from the creation of the world. And then Isaiah 34, 11, um, it's going to talk about, uh, um, emptiness. Um, it says, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven, talking about Babylon, shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon the line of confusion the stones, the stones of emptiness or the stones of the void. Um, and that word confusion is tohu, which is uh, um, uh, that word that's without form. Right. So tohu is um, and the bohu is this emptiness. It's kind of interesting. They sort of like a rhyme. And then this line of confusion, it shall stretch upon it the line of confusion. So this is a measuring line, tohu and the stones, ebon of the void. So what is this symbol that's being used here by uh, Isaiah? What does he mean? To stretch out upon it the line, the measuring line of confusion and the stones of the void of emptiness. Does this not bring us back to Babylon and to Satan's origin? I wouldn't say so much his his, his origin as as uh, referring to his end. Okay, well, his end, but but when I'm talking about his origin, I'm talking intellectually, the idea of confusion, the the right. thinking, 
that that comes right yeah so that's why his end is the void uh the bottomless pit um because it starts there it's just the natural result of his thinking so if we stretch out upon it the line of confusion that is um and the it here would be um basically uh, i'm just trying to see it's god's people the nation it doesn't say the city um it's talking about idumea edom so this is talking about judgments on the nations or edom but we would include here babylon <clears throat> okay oh, christ said in proverbs that all that hate me love death so that would certainly fit in yeah yeah, so anyway, getting back to this whole idea of this origins of um, you know, these beasts that come out of the bottomless pit. We definitely can't apply this bottomless pit to republicanism. So, so we have to apply it just as a this is means that these beasts are of satanic origin. That would be the best way to explain it. Why that symbol is being used. Right. So to say that this is somehow connected with uh, republicanism, I, I just don't see it. An atheistic brand of republicanism republicanism or democracy wreaked havoc during the French Revolution. So he's going to just say that Republican and republicanism and democracy is the only conceivable tie between the four passages. And I don't see that. I also don't see this idea that Islam is um, a democracy, even though he has a quote here. Um, you know, that's the early point part in the origins of Islam early on. Um but that definitely is not what Islam came to be. So <clears throat> I don't know. It, it, it just seems to me a very odd uh, interpretation. Okay, this beat that that this beast that beast which beast right. So this this is part of the problem that we have here. What beast is ref being referred to? Revelation talks about the dragon and several beasts. How do we keep from confusing one beast with another? Revelation 13 gives us a clue. The first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10 seems to be consistently called throughout the book, the beast. The second beast of 13, 11 is identified as another beast and then is never called a beast again. Instead, to prevent confusion, he is called the false prophet. In Revelation 16, 13, 1920 and 2010. In all three of these passages, he appears alongside the beast. Both are pictured together. One is called the beast and the other is called the false prophet. With this suggest, what this suggests is that whenever we read about the beast, we must be reading about the first beast of Revelation 13. And there I would agree. So I don't think when you talk about the beast, you can be talking about the dragon of Revelation 12. You'd have to be talking about the beast of Revelation 13. Um, and even when they talk about the beast, the woman and the beast, the beast and the woman that sitteth upon it, um, we would have to say that that beast, in, in that case, we have to say, is this talking about the beast? Of Revelation, that's just been explained or the beast of Revelation 13. So that's what we have to kind of discern. It doesn't seem to me that, um, that it can be that there, that it can be the beast of Revelation 13. It must be referring to the scarlet colored beast. But when it gives the explanation and it talks about the beast that was and is not, that can't be the beast that the woman is riding upon. This is now the explanation of the woman and the beast by going back to Revelation 13. Um, apparently, John is indicating that 
he has seen something new when he sees this scarlet colored beast. Um, then the beast he saw in Revelation 16, 13, right, which is connected with the dragon beast and the false prophet. We would then expect that in every place afterwards where the first beast of Revelation 13 is intended, he will be identified as the beast. In every place where the beast of Revelation 17 is intended, some sort of qualifier will be added to enable us to distinguish him from the first beast of Revelation 13. What makes this more apparent is the fact that Revelation 16, 13 pictures the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all involved in getting people to battle to the battle of Armageddon. Then we have the scarlet beast of Revelation 17. And then we have an actual picture of the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, etc., in which the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are all seen. Clearly, the beast of Revel of 1613 must be the same as the beast of 1920. And in a month in as in as much as the scarlet beast of chapter 17 is a beast instead of the beast, he must be a totally different beast set apart by some sort of qualifiers whenever he is mentioned. So he's going to do a verse by verse analysis, which uh, we have done, but let's look at his analysis. The angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which has seven heads and ten horns. Which beast? Clearly the qualifier identifies this beast as the one that John just saw, the scarlet beast. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall descend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. Which beast? The Scarlet Beast, Republicanism, was the order of the day before Augustus Caesar. It was not in John's day. It would ascend to be a dominant force in the end. Okay, so we can see he's still stuck on this Republicanism. Okay, so one thing he hasn't really done here with Revelation 17. Uh, he's going to say that the explanation is from John's day. What he hasn't done is placed what time John is seeing. Right. <clears throat> and if this is the beast of Revelation uh, uh, of 17, he has to try to just dis to describe what beast this is. What beast is the woman uh, riding? Now he's just trying to say that this beast represents republicanism. Right? Is that what he's saying? That republicanism was, this is the scarlet colored beast. It wasn't in John's day and it's going to arise again. What are some problems with this interpretation of these passages? Or is he correct? Well, we seem to have trouble with saying that this scarlet colored beast is a Republican form of government. So if the beast was the Republican form of government, um, we have seven heads. So those heads must be what? Is it really? He's saying that they're going to be the seven forms of Roman government. And that we're in this period of where there's, we're in, the, in, in imperial Rome. So we're, we've got this beast with seven heads, but, but can the beast be republicanism if it's only one of the heads of the beast? Now, what he's saying is we have this beast. So this beast can't be republicanism. The beast has to be something, right? Because there are five that are fallen. Those are forms of Roman government. One is that's imperial Rome. 
and ones to come. That's paper world. Do you see the problem that we can't just take the beast to represent here one of the heads, right? Because it still doesn't tell us when is John in vision? That is, what point is he looking at? Is he in 1798? Where is he? I know this is this is a difficult topic because we're looking at all these different views and trying to keep them straight in our heads. <clears throat> Mustn't this beast, in order to explain the the mystery of the woman of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Wouldn't it make more sense to see, say the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit as referring to um, the first beast, the beast that's labeled as in the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, that beast. Or, or are we going to say, well, because it says the beast that thou sawest was. We see the problem here. So we still have this problem of how do we identify this beast? Okay, so let's let's take a look here again. So now we have to think about this whole thing as a continuous narrative going from uh, chapter 12, where we're going to see first the great red dragon. And that's going to be the history uh, describing pagan Rome. It's going to bring us obviously up to the 1260 years and the 1260 years are going to bring us to the end of those years where we see uh um, in 13, we're going to see the first beast. And then we see the United States, the second beast. So we're seeing that transition from Papal Rome to the United States. And then in chapter 17, we have this, uh, one of the angels that had the seven vials is going to come uh, and show to John the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we're going to see this. He's going to be carried away into the wilderness. He's going to see this woman, Mystery Babylon the Great. So he's sort of brought back into the past, our past, the future in his time. He's going to be shown this woman. And then... He's going to marvel about this woman. And the angel said, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Now we know um, the connection here is going to be to uh, the other mystery, which has to do with 666, right? Um the, the wisdom, the mind that has wisdom, it's these things are connected. We have these mysteries where we need wisdom. <clears throat> so it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not. So if this beast is this beast that this woman's riding at the end of the world. And we know that the seven heads here are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth, which is the seat of Rome. Um, this beast would have to be what beast? The scarlet colored beast, what is it? We would say the kingdoms of this world. That is the civil authority of Rome. So this woman, which is a church, um, uses this civil, civil authority to 
interact with the kingdoms of this world. Okay, so so we're going to have to keep that in mind. Now let's let's just go a little further here. Um, so he's going to use an example here. So I'm going to switch back screens here. Um, interestingly, not until World War One did this even begin to come true. Though it was almost during the revolutions almost did during the revolutions of 1848. During World War I, the monarchies of Turkey, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Russia all met their demise. And the world had been marching on toward a conference of republics and democracies ever since. Not that communist Russia fit the bill, but that's where the world had been heading ever since World War I. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other's not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. As mentioned before, the interpretation being suggested here typically identifies the first five kings as being the five of the following forms of government. Kings, consuls, dictators, semivirates, uh, military tribunes and with consular power, and the triumvirate. Um, And then, uh, so those would be A, B, C, D, E, F. So those are six different forms, um, right? Because he's got A, B, C, D, E, and F. So he has six different forms. And But yet, it's going to be one of those five of the following forms of government. So that's how they would look at the first five kings. Some expositors have left out military tribunes, and others have left out the triumvirate. But both of these were legitimate heads of the government at one time or another. Perhaps the simplest solution to needing to choose five of the six is to start with the founding of the, of the Republic in 509 BC. This then leaves out the monar uh, monarchical form of government from the list. Would this be permissible? The records of the seven monarchs who reigned before the Republic start with Romulus. Okay. Um, so we're not going to go into this any further here. I think, because my mind is, is very tired of all these puzzles I've been puzzling through. You're probably in the same point, so we've lost our attention, at least I have. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow and try to understand pioneer view here and if there's some way that something we can salvage from it or if it just needs to be jettisoned. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and help us to continue to study these things. We know, Lord, there's a lot of confusion at this point and we want to have a clear understanding. And so we just pray that you can help us in studying this, this out individually and then watching uh, for those watching these videos to take the time uh, to go through them. May your Holy Spirit continue to teach us. We pray in it and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.